today's going to be a little bit different than what I what I do usually. Um, we're going to hit the ground running, and you're going to introduce everybody. I need to. My case. Wait, I need it. I'll be by you because Earth has already gotten me through this. <laughs> Stand close over here. Stand close over here. We're good. But I need to be by you because you have the microphone. So you're hooked into him. Yes, mother. We work well. First of all, when you go into your folder, I want you to first take out the bios because without these people, this is not possible. Obviously, we have Dr. Cindy here, who we really need to thank because she's a very busy person and she has helped round this out and make this probably one of the best experiences that you're going to have in a long time. She's here to answer questions. Um, because we have one microphone, what we're going to ask is that when you ask a question, Dr. Cindy, if you could repeat it so that everybody knows and so that people that are out there know. Um, we have Annie Provenzano. Annie, if you will stand up. She is our vet tech. Um, we thank her for volunteering to come and do this. And we have Trish Blakely. Trish very cordially said, hey, you know, this is my specialty. I can help with this. Do you want me? Well, duh. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me doing it. And then the Breed Ed Committee, and um, I would like you to stand. You have to experience these people. They humble you each week. We meet every week for at least two hours. And we have been up till 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning to finish off the project. And everybody works, and everybody has dogs, so you get it. Um, we have Barbara Cleek. Barbara, where are you? I'm working. She's working. <laughs> They're paid well by the CC of A. <laughs> Lee Cohen. Lee, where are you? Lee, you need to step in. She is our mentor liaison, so you're going to want to get with Lee so that you will go to that mentoring. Please go there. Again, I'm the badge Nazi. You need your badge to get in. Come often. Thank your mentors. Don't be afraid to talk to them. Do we have some of the mentors here? If you are a mentor for Breed Ed, you are going to do Breed Ed? No. Raise your hand. Stand up so they can see that some of you are here. Please make sure that you go and see these people. They will help you immensely. We have Debbie Holland. Debbie? She's got a really good, quiet sense of humor. Don't let her fool you. Okay. The naughty boy of the community who spends a lot of time in the corner is Larry Parsons. Larry is our photographer. Don't believe that. That tells you something. He has to exonerate himself. Um, Nancy McDonald. Nancy is over here. She's our techie. And without her, I don't know what I would do. Um, Mary Robichon, who is doing our Facebook right now. And then me. Um, we also have a couple people that just were enlisted. Um, Jerry Saluski, if you will stand up. Sorry, Stan. <laughs> See his face? He's helping with technology today. And also Sue. Sue, stand up. Thank you very much. Um, when you see these people, give them a high five. A lot of work goes into this. And we have Irv and his wife who have done a wonderful job taping this for us. These discs will be available because if you're like me, there's so much you're going to learn. You're going to take so many notes and you're going to go, huh? You will uh huh after you see this. It's a wonderful thing to have. Now go to the other side. Thank you for standing so still. Dr. Cindy has given us two handouts. One is your LH chart and one is uh, questions that breeders have formulated. You will be using that during the seminar. The next thing you have should be the agenda. It's double-sided, so this is kind of how it's going to go. But we're flexible. If something comes up spontaneously, that will happen. This is certainly not a complete list of terms, but it's a good primer for you. Um, of course, no breed ed would be complete without the Collie Standard. You have this, refer to this all week and particularly when you're going to that mentoring. And then finally, the national can be overwhelming. How do you do it? How do you view it? How do you get the most out of it? Here's the worksheet. Any questions?
take your phones and make sure they are on vibrate. Remember, you don't want to talk and disturb. And how do you want to handle the questions? I want to handle the questions as we're going along. Okay, so if a question pops up, don't hesitate to just raise your hand and say, well, can you clarify this or this happened to me or whatever. Um, I prefer that instead of having questions at the end. Okay, again, Dr. Yeah. Cindy. Thanks, guys. Um, like I said, this is going to be a little different than usual. We're going to do a couple of things. The first thing is that we're going to go over the usual stuff, which is estrous cycle, breeding dogs, how to breed a dog, how to evaluate sperm. But we're also going to go over how to save some money while you do it, which I think all of us want to know. The other thing is, is that you've got a little piece of paper here that, uh, thank you, Trish, um, which are some questions that we all need to answer. And you can answer them anonymously, but when you get a chance, answer them. And then I want to collect them um, when we take our break before we do our wet lab. And that way we can go over them and see what's going on. Because we are having a lot of breeding problems right now. I don't know if any of you know that. We're having a lot of breeding problems all over the country. Um, it's not just one specific breed. It's not just our breed. Dobermans are doing it. Corgis are doing it. Other breeds are doing it. So what I want you to do is I want you to seriously consider these questions when you get a chance in between all my gabbing and answer them. And then I'm going to go over these right before we do the wet lab. Okay? But if you have any questions during, just stop me. Okay? So my first question is, so you want to be a breeder? This is how I've started out my lecture since Pat Starkweather was around and I wrote a chapter for her book. Um, you go to the next slide. This is why you want to be a breeder. So you can have babies, so you can play with them, so you can see them all the time. Um, the, um, every animal in the world continues by breeding and some of them have our help and some of them don't have our help. Why breed? My favorite question to ask clients when they come in is why should I breed my dog? And my least favorite answer is because I want my children to see the miracle of birth. <laughs> and I tell them now just go on YouTube, you know, you can, you can pick it up on YouTube. We breed because we want to improve the qualities of our breed, because we want to enhance certain qualities, because we want to look at our breed as the best that we possibly can make. And we do this by breeding systemically, by, breed, by breeding systematically, and by looking not at the generation that you're doing now, but at three or four generations ahead. When somebody comes in and they say they're going to breed a dog, the first thing that I do is I do a full breeding exam. And I like to do my full breeding exams about two to three months before I'm going to breed the dog. Two to three months, especially for the male, because it takes the sperm sample, a sperm cycle in the male takes about two to three months. So if a male comes in to me and he has no sperm, then I can kind of try to figure out what's going on. And then that gives me two or three months to produce sperm. The female, I can wait until she's a month before she's ready to go in. But I want them, there are a couple things. Before breeding, I want a full wellness exam. And I want a full wellness panel. Now, not everybody can pay for that. I can tell you that at my hospital, it costs about $145 to have a full wellness. That includes thyroid, liver, kidneys, pancreas, CBC, the whole thing. So for $145, you can get that done. I do a total physical exam. I want to make sure that the dog that I'm breeding, and I have had dogs come in from all over the world that walk into my office and say, I want to breed my bitch, and the first thing I do is put a stethoscope to the heart, and I hear an absolutely horrible murmur. So the next thing that I do is I send them down the street to the cardiologist because it's usually a huge defect that nobody has picked up. And it's usually something that's genetic that's going to be passed on generation after generation. So I do a full physical exam. I check the weight of the animal. I hate obese animals. You know, one of the things that, that bothers me the most is when somebody brings this, and Labradors are notorious for this. I mean, Labradors, you'll see them walk in the room and they're big, clunky animals like this. And the people say, I want a breeder. And I go, well, why don't you lose 20 pounds first, you know? 
And I will do that before I even consider breeding the dog. If we miss this heat cycle, we miss this heat cycle. But obese dogs and emaciated dogs are not ones that should be bred. I do fecal samples because I want to make sure that they don't have any, any um, fecal parasites. And if they do, I want to take care of that before. There's also another way to take care of it during. If you give an interceptor, which is, the uh, interceptor is back in the market. Did you guys know that? Yes. Yes. As of March 2nd, it is back in the market. And if you give an interceptor to a bitch that is pregnant at day 45 of pregnancy, then she will not pass worms on to her babies. So just, just a little thing to remember. Um, I do heartworm samples because a bitch that has heartworms, a lot of times the heartworms will migrate into the puppies and it's not the best thing in the world for your puppies. It's also not the best thing to put a stress of pregnancy on your, on your bitch. Um, the external parasites and preventative. Now this is one that's a really, really big question. Um, I live in Florida. We have a lot of tick-borne diseases and if we don't use external parasiticides, then we end up with things like Babesia, Ehrlichia, Anaplasmosis, um, Lyme disease, we end up with all those things. What do you use? What do I, okay, question. <laughs> well, for the longest time, I used uh, Avon Skin So Soft. That worked really, really well. The dogs smelled good. They were a little bit greasy, but that was okay. And then came Advantage. Advantage seemed to work. And then came Frontline, and Frontline seemed to work. And then the fleas and the ticks got immune to those. So I went to uh, NextGuard, and NextGuard seemed to work. And then this drug called Trifexis came out, which was Spinosad, which we're gonna talk about problem pregnancies. And um, I honestly think that one of the biggest things that happened was Spinosad. And even though it works beautifully, I can tell you that it's listed for, for use for fleas, but it also works for ticks, unless you have an absolutely horrible tick problem. So I think anything that's that, that's that great, that takes care of all those bugs, probably is doing something else internally to your primordial cells. And it seems that most of our problems that we have seen, although not all of the dogs have been on Trifexis, have been since the advent of Trifexis. So since um, Interceptor's back, what I am doing is I'm going back to Interceptor, and I'm gonna go back to something like Advantage. And that's all, that's all I really can do. Dr. Cindy, what, what about uh, Revolution? Is an RAR I hate RAR. Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then you must have an MDR normal, normal dog. I do not. Okay, then well, you're I very do, lucky. I do, but I have a combination of, I also have... Mutants. Do you have any mutant mutants? I, yes, and you're I, using I, it on I, that? I, I, yes, and I've never had one. I would be, I would, well, you're lucky. Okay. Okay, that's all I can tell you, you're lucky. <laughs> I love it on cats. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it on cats. But don't put your cats next to your colleagues, you know, because your colleagues will groom your cat. Can you go back to the, sorry. Yeah. Ticks are big dogs and obese. Yeah, you guys really do have a big problem. A person mentioned any relative different type of ticks because that is, the front line works sometimes. Front line works sometimes, yes. I've had this shot, I've had front line, front line, but not to me. So I mean, we've all had situations like that. Do you suggest you're walking in it every, every couple of months and don't make a difference? You're, you're shaking up the, the, the tick? Well, have you tried next card, the new one? I've not tried next card. Okay, try the new one. Okay. Uh, what I really think happens is that the ticks just become immune yeah. to the products that we are using, and that's why they have to constantly change them. Okay. And you do. I mean, the tick problems are horrible, absolutely horrible. And how ticks are immune to the Absolutely. Absolutely. Number one, um, if you have something like Ehrlichia, I mean, Ehrlichia can cause your, it's called pancytopenia. It causes all of your blood cells to drop. So if you don't have any red blood cells or any white blood cells or any platelets, number one, if you make it to well-being and you start bleeding after well-being, you're going to bleed to death. Um, Lyme disease look, really lowers your fertility. Most of them do. So it is something. External parasites are a real booger. I mean, they really are. It's really tough to take care of them. So, you know, it's something we need to work on. We need to work on. And can I tell you what I honestly do now? And this is gonna probably really freak you guys all out. I do nothing. I live in Florida, and when I breed my bitches, I do nothing. They get absolutely nothing. 
I pray. I also live on the east side of Fort Lauderdale where we do not have the mosquito that carries our rooms. So, and if I see a tick, I pick it off. Yes? Do you ever use diatomaceous earth? I use diatomaceous earth. I find out that that works very, very well in the yard. Um, I cannot tell you the exact mechanism that it works. Um, I know people that feed diatomaceous earth to their animals and uh, have had success, but I can't tell you scientifically what it does or what effect it has on fertility because I haven't really looked at it. I've heard that the, the little chips of diatom stick in the plates. In the, in the spiracles, yeah. Yeah, and they, they suffocate. Yeah, they suffocate to death, yeah. But it's not toxic. That's so mean. <laughs> <laughs> If you give your, okay, this is going back to your LH chart. This is going back to your LH chart, which you have in front of you. If you look at your LH chart, you consider that day zero. Oh, you did, I'm sorry. Okay, look at your neighbors then. If you look at the LH chart, your LH chart during your breeding um, period is considered day zero. If you consider that day zero, if you give a normal dose of interceptor to your bitch at day 45 after your LH, LH is zero, then you will decrease the transmission of transplacental parasites across the uterus to the puppies. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so any more questions about bugs? I hate bugs. I, yes. Oh, I knew you would have one. <laughs> have you used Provectone yet? Have I used what? It's an oral pill. Yes, but I don't anymore. I don't see it. How do you feel in your practice? We have a lot of clients on it. What about white-footed herbie dogs? I'm scared to give it. I, you know, that's, that's me. So I just haven't. We have a lot of mixed-breed dogs, though, that are I honestly think mixed breed dogs can take a direct hit by an atomic yeah. bomb. <laughs> 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 okay, so what is that? Okay, the exact date. Looking at your LH chart. Your LH is day zero. If you treat your bitch with interceptor on day 45 after your LH, you will decrease the transmission of transplacental worms to the puppies. So you know those puppies that are born that have a lot of hookworms, a lot of roundworms, a lot of all that stuff? You'll get rid of those. You won't get rid of uh, coccidia that comes later. That actually comes from nursing. So. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. We can do bugs all day. We have... <laughs> I, I just have to fly back to go to work tonight. That's all. Uh, next guard. Next guard. The question is, what is next guard? Next guard is the latest generation in flea and tick prevention, and it is an oral medication, and it does work, and it's safe. But I'm also telling you that when I breed my dogs and my bitches, <coughs> my bitches do not get anything during their pregnancy. How about how soon before, like if they come in? <laughs> you know they're coming in season. You stop everything mid. If you no, know I don't. I don't stop everything till the day before I breathe. Yeah. <laughs> what about the insecticides? People are spraying on the dog. Oh my God, the organophosphates. Well, one of the big things, one of the big drugs that is not allowed during pregnancy is organophosphates. Okay. You don't spray. <laughs> so organophosphates are not suggested during pregnancy. And if you have a dog. Well, your worst part is your exterminator that comes out and sprays your yard and then dumps all of his excess under your dog's favorite bush. Uh -huh. yeah. And then your dog goes down and lays in that favorite bush, okay? And he comes up and he has organophosphate. <coughs> so that, that's, that's a big no-no. You have a question over here? Yes. One more on the heartworm. What do you think about the neutral mosquitoes that are damaging? <coughs> Even that diet, it's the old diethylcarbamazine? Yes. Well, I think it's great. 
You can get it from Canada. Right. Yeah, it's also called Nemocide. Um, unfortunately, I had a tough time taking my own birth control pill. So I had a tough time giving my dog a daily, a daily pill. Um, yes, back there. Stand up so we can hear you. I was wondering about the Sentinel Spectrum. Sentinel Spectrum is a no-no. That's the one you're getting from Australia. Oh, really? Yes. Because it also has another another product that you don't want to give to a bitch that's, that's pregnant. Now, okay. Cindy, yes, ma'am. You said you could talk on bugs all day. Please don't. Let's talk on trees. Okay. Sorry. 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 If you have I hate bugs. You know. Talk to you later on bugs. I hate ticks. I hate fleas. I mean, I, I I'm definitely allergic to fleas. So the best thing that happened to me was advantage. <laughs> Okay, health screening. This is something that the Kali Health Foundation will help you about. And uh, your breed education will help you. I do believe in health screening. I don't think you can do enough health screening. Um, if you're going to be using chilled or frozen semen, you have to do DNA. Okay, that type of DNA is the type that you send in it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> into a AKC. And AKC only does the DNA for parentage. They don't do the DNA for anything else. If you want something done for, um, for your PRA or your CEA or your MDR1, those all have to be sent out to outside labs. You can't send one swab to AKC and expect everything to be done. And if you go on the Kali Health Foundation, you will, have, you will find a list of all the tests that we run and all the rebates we give back. So if you are going to use this animal for breeding, you really need to get it tested. OFA, you should, if you have a popular sire, you have a dog that everybody wants to use, you should have its, its heart OFA and cleared, um, preferably with an echo, with an echocardiogram. A regular practitioner can do it, because I do it all the time. But if you really, really want to get a stamp of approval on your dog's heart, you go to a cardiologist. That is going to cost you anywhere from $300 to $500. Okay, so you're getting some money here. You need to have the hips at least OFA. Because even though a lot of people in the poly breed say we don't have problems, we do have problems. So anybody that says that we don't have problems is wrong. Um, I have absolutely beautiful bitches that I've done stem cell therapy on because their hips were so bad. Of course, they live for two years longer after the stem cell therapy, but um, you should have their eyes examined. And that's the other thing. You don't only have their eyes examined once. You should have their eyes examined every year because there are some late onset diseases that happen to colleagues, such as late onset PRA, which fortunately, and especially the people in this room, because I know you, you care about this, we are starting to, we, we got rid of it, for, we never got rid of it. But we lowered it for a while, and all of a sudden it reared its ugly head, and now it's going back down again, which I'm very, very happy about. And a lot of that's from our DNA testing. Because you remember what we used to have to do before, right? We used to have to breed blind dogs. We don't do that anymore. Okay. Choosing the proper dogs to breed. Not all dogs need to be bred. Just because you have a beautiful collie and you think it's the sweetest collie in the whole wide world and everything else, um, maybe it doesn't need to be bred. Maybe it, you, don't, you don't need to breed this dog because it doesn't represent all the, tr the attributes of the breed. And it doesn't have all the good health issues of the breed. So some of these dogs, even though they're beautiful, I mean, you know, I had an absolutely beautiful male, and he had a brain aneurysm. And he's a dog that would have, would have potentially caused some real vascular problems in other dogs. So not, you love them while you have them, and not all dogs need to be bred. The difference between genotype and phenotype, does anybody not know that? Excellent. Okay, next slide. The bitch. When I see the bitch, I had the bitch come into my hospital, like I said, I want her at least a month before. And what I want to do at that time, sometimes that's not possible because if dogs fly in from other countries, then um, you know I, I get them the day to be bred. But I, what I do is I do a breeding history. 
And on this breeding history, I include the siblings and the ancestors. How are the sisters doing? How are the brothers doing? How were the grandmothers? How were the aunts? How were the, how were the uncles? I want to know if there's a problem, because if I have a line that consistently has misses, that consistently has small litters, that consistently has abortions, then I need to know about that ahead of time. And that's probably one of the biggest things, is that you need to know the breeding history of your bitch. That way you can, has she ever been bred before? And if she were bred before, was it successful? And are you planning on using the same, the same male? Or are you going to go to, to another male? These are all things that are important. I do a full physical exam. And on my physical exam, there are a lot of things that show up. I don't know what many of these things that you guys have seen, but when you start doing a vagin vaginoscopy on a dog, you see some really weird stuff. There's a thing called vaginal hyperplasia, where when the bitch goes into heat, this big bubble comes out of her. And it's a big piece of tissue. And these bitches can actually be bred. You just have to breed them artificially or by surgical insemination. And then what you have to do is you have to shove all that in. You usually do it by putting her on her head. You shove it all back in and you suture her vulva closed to keep it all inside. Because if you leave this vaginal hyperplasia, which is the tissue that's supposed to be on the inside that's on the outside, sometimes as low as her knees, you want to push it all back up, put it back where it belongs, or it will get, become necrotic. It'll actually die because it's not supposed to be on the outside. It's supposed to be on the inside. So the other thing that we have that was, is a really, really big problem is occasionally we get what's called a persistent hymen. And a persistent hymen, uh, a dog's hymen is supposed to go away at birth. But occasionally you'll have a persistent hymen. And what happens is when you, when you do a vaginal and you put your finger in there, you can actually feel a tissue. And a tissue can be anything from a full tissue across there to a little tiny band, all right? And that's what you're feeling for. If I have my bitch in there a month ahead of time and I feel that there is a persistent hymen and it's possibly going to be a natural breeding, I will go in and I will strum it backwards and pull it. It hurts the bitch for a second and she bleeds a little tiny bit, but it gets rid of that problem. Um, Mammary glands. Some, I check my mammary glands to make sure that there are no tumors there. Okay, because I want to make sure that I'm not going to run into problems as far as the mammary glands are concerned. Um, we have had bitches. I had a bitch that, that flew in from China that we were supposed to breed, and she had tumors in her breasts. And I'm like, why are you going to go through this? Because all it's going to do with the estrogen surge that happens during, during heat cycle, all it's going to do is make it worse. If you want a breeder, Remove the tumors first, then breed her. So I want to make sure that her mammary glands are fine. And the other thing is, is, is a septum. And a septum is really kind of funny, especially if you do an artificial insemination, because you actually can inseminate only one horn. And when you go up into the vagina, OK, the vagina goes up like this, and then it goes into two horns. And you have ovaries that are up here. If you go up into the vagina, it's supposed to be nice and wide open. But sometimes those two horns that come down don't separate into the body, and this little piece of tissue will be right here. So when you go to do an artificial insemination, you can actually go up one side or the other side. OK? Or it can make it so a male cannot get in there. So when a male is trying to inseminate a bitch, he cannot actually get into the vaginal vault. So when I do that, I usually inseminate them artificially, and I put half up the right side and half up the left side. So it works just great. So those are the things. But I want my bitch healthy. Like I said, I don't want an obese bitch. I don't want a skinny bitch. I want my bitch healthy. I want her, I want her to look like an athlete. OK. Testing. One, two, three. This is Orly's test. These are Orly's tests, and Orly's sitting on the floor away, right behind you. Um, there are tests that I run. The first one is brucellosis. And the reason that I run my brucellosis test first in my hospital is that brucellosis is a communicable disease to people. And if the dog has brucellosis, then I stop right there. If the brucellosis comes up with what's called a false positive, I send the blood out, to, and it's a blood test. 
I send the blood out to a different lab and have it reconfirmed um, positive or negative. Because you can also get you all you can get a lot of false positives with brucellosis, the test that you run in the hospital. So brucellosis, what it can what it can do, and this is part of the problem, is that brucellosis can cause abortion, it can cause no no takes, it can cause mummified fetuses, it can cause all sorts of horrible stuff. Plus, it is of public health significance. If you get, if you happen to contact brucellosis from your dog, what will happen is you will get what's called undulant fever. And undulant fever is like a, is like a flu, it's like a flu, flu like, it's like a flu, flu like problem. And it's called undulant fever because it goes like this: you get sick, you don't get sick; you get sick, you don't get sick. And it goes up and down. There is no cure. There is also no cure if your dog is positive for brucellosis. So what we suggest, we don't see it very much, thank goodness. I think the last time I saw it was in a kennel in, in Georgia. But we don't see it very much. It is not a disease that is passed only by, um, by insemination. It is a disease that is passed primarily in, it can go in urine. It can also go in any kind of discharge from the body. So it could go in milk. It used to be called dairy farmer's disease because cows get it too. So I do brucellosis. I also do a vaginal culture and sensitivity. And I like to do these like a month before I'm gonna breathe a bitch because if there's a problem, I wanna address it. I mean, if there are any kind of problems, I wanna address it. So I do it about a month before. Um, I also do mycoplasma. Now mycoplasma, how many of you do mycoplasma? Oh, that's good. <laughs> Mycoplasma is an organism that a lot of veterinarians are unsure about whether it causes a problem or not. To me, it causes a problem. Um, I have seen abortions from it. Um, it is also primarily a respiratory disease. I have seen mummified fetuses come from it. So if I have a bitch that cultures out positive for mycoplasma, I do treat it. And I treat it with antibiotics. Um, I usually use Xenoquin. Because, um, or I can use Betro, and a lot that's controversial, but I only use it for the first two weeks of pregnancy. Because if you use um, Betro at the last of pregnancy, remember what it does. It slows down the formation of bone and cartilage. So, and that's what happens in the last couple of weeks of pregnancy. So you don't want to do that. So I do treat uh, mycoplasma on my culture and sensitivity. I do not like beta hemolytic strep. I don't like Klebsiella, I don't like E. coli. There are a bunch of bacteria that I don't like. So if I have something that's nasty, I treat that too. My drugs of choice are Clavamox and Amoxicillin for those usually. I also use Cephalexin because those are safe during pregnancy. They're drugs that are safe, they're drugs that are not safe. And those are drugs that are safe during pregnancy. Um, the other things that I do is I do progesterone testing, and I usually like my bitches to come in when they're at about 60 days. And they come in, they come in when they're about 30 days uh, before they're ready to be bred. And my, I, I like for them to come in for my progesterone at six days after they've started their heat cycle. And the reason for that is that there's some bitches that are really early LH peakers, and that's the big name, the big name. And there's some that are really, really late LH peakers. So I like my bitches to come in when they're about six days in the heat. And what I start doing at that point is I start doing vaginal smears. And I'm going to tell you about some kits that. Do you guys do home kits? You do do home kits. Which ones do you use? Um, it's, um, it's a white box, red print. <laughs> <laughs> Buy all that? Yes. <laughs> we have some kids up here that we're going to play with. Um, the, you can do all of this at home, but you got to get pretty good at it. And with the first couple of times that you start doing this, I probably would do it with a vet at the same time. But about day six, you want to start doing your progesterone testing. Now, if you have all the money in the world, which in, the, in, the, in uh, Orly's case, I had all the money in the world. Actually, I get it done for free. Um, I ran her progesterone twice a day, every day. 
Okay? She got tired of getting poked, but I ran it twice a day, every day. My progesterones cost $68 a progesterone. If you run it through IDEX, it is at least $125 per progesterone. I'm sorry, that's outrageous. That's, that's highway robbery. There is no excuse for that. Um, it's a big enough lab, they should give you a break, especially if you are a breeder, you should get a break. Um, and then one of these little kits are only like $170 and you can do 10 of them. But you have to be good at them. You have to be good at them. So for $17 a piece, that's pretty good. Um, my favorite one is Target, which I have, didn't happen to bring one. Target was the original one. Target is my favorite. And Target is a colorometric test. Um, you have to get really good at looking at robin's egg blue and different colors of robin's, robin's egg blue because you take your serum, you know, you take your blood from your dog, which we're going to learn to do today. You take your blood from your dog, you take a little drop of it, you put it on this little, little, little piece of paper or the little cup, whichever one you buy. And if it turns bright, if it turns bright robin's egg blue, then her progesterone is really, really low. If it turns a little lighter robin's egg blue, and we got to be really good at this one, but if it turns a little lighter robin's egg blue, that means that your progesterone is starting to rise. Which, if you can pick that exact time that's a little tiny bit blue, then that's when you run another kit that's called an LH kit that only costs $135 and you have 10 tests in it. Which, in the veterinary office, we charge 55 other places charge 155 So, hey, Lee, can you give me some more water? Please? You guys have it dry out here. It's really dry. Did you say there were 10 tests in the Yep. LH. That is my favorite test, I have to tell you. You know, you guys could go with all the other tests, but that's my absolute favorite test. So anyway, of all the ones that, that are available, you have, and you, can, you guys can order these right off, um, you know, right, right by yourself. There's, um, there are three of them. There's the Optimate, there's um, the Camelot Farms one, which is, Camelot Farms for me is just too, there's too much to do. You know, there are too many tests that are involved in it. Um, but Camelot Farm has one, Biometallics has Target, okay? So just remember, biometallics. They have the target test. They are the place that you want to go. Now, for your LH test, the best LH test that's on the market right now for you to do at home is Witness, okay? It's made by Symbiotics and Pfizer Animal Health. But this is what you want, okay? So you get these two test kits. They cost you like 300 bucks. Their shelf life is about a year and a half. So if you're breeding three bitches, you, you easily could do, use those for three bitches. So it's crazy for you to be going to, the, going to the animal hospital. Once you get the feel of this, going to the animal hospital and having them charge you $125 to $150 per test. So I'm sorry I'm losing myself money, but it is, it is the way it is. So anyway, I start testing. I, I do smears only because I do smears, and I keep hitting that. Um, when your bitch is about 60% cornified is when I start to do my progesterone testing. And if you have one of these really cheap kits, you should do it at the same time every day. If you're fortunate like I am, you do it twice a day at the same time every day. But if you do it at the same time every day, then you will notice that slight change from robin's egg blue to lighter robin's egg blue. Now the next change that happens is when your progesterone gets up to five, your little white, your little blue test will turn white. That means that her progesterone is at five. And at, yes. What color is it to begin with? Robin's egg, it, well it's, it's clear. Okay, so you, you, it's clear, you put your, it's clear you put your drop of, of serum on it. And if you have no progesterone, or really low progesterone, it turns a beautiful Robin's egg blue. Is it like that color on the shirt right there? That one? It's a little brighter. Yeah, it's the one on the oh, these, no, that right. no, these, that's LH. Oh, no, this is King. This is King. This, this gets the crown. Let me, 
if it's a little bit it's a little bit lighter than your shirt, but it is that kind of Robin's egg blue. Okay? And then it'll kind of get to your Robin's egg blue. <laughs> and then it will turn white. Okay? And then it'll turn white. And when it turns white, as soon as it turns white, you know that your progesterone is about five. Okay. <laughs> Usually, if you were going to breed side by side, or natural, or artificial, but you're going to do it all by yourself, and you can breed three or four times, then you want to breed, uh, after day five, you want to breed two days, four days, six days later. Okay? If you get three breedings. Yes? If you have a bitch that ovulates very early, like you told me at day six and she's already at 12, should you... You know, if you catch her at five on day six, should you still wait two days, or does that mean she's going to go quick? No, I'd start breeding her then. Okay. I'd start breeding her, especially if you have a male side by side. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy, could you repeat what she asked? So okay, sorry. If you have a, if you have a bitch that comes into you and she's an early ovulator and she's like white at day six of her heat cycle, yeah. <laughs> and she may already be above five you know, above the time that it's ready to breed. You just breed her. Don't, don't, wait, two <coughs> don't wait two days, just breed her. Breed her that, two day, that, that, and two days later, and two days later. Is there a top cap on that number where you don't, you can't breed them anymore? No. I mean, like, if it goes up to 24, 32, or no. whatever, and you're going to sell? What do we have, 40? What do we have, 40? That you bred on? With Dr. Cindy? Yeah, I think so. No, there is not. I bred a Great Dane at 29 and had 12 puppies. Okay, so there is not an upper number. The most important thing that you can do is once you see that Robin's egg blue going from Robin's egg blue and a little lighter Robin's egg blue, you run an LH test. Because that is probably when your LH is going to be positive. And once you have an LH test, then you know that you're going to ovulate two days later, okay? And that it's going to take two to three days for those eggs to mature in the oviducts in order to be ready to be um, fertilized. So you know that you're going to breed, so that's two days that they're fertilized, I mean that they're, that they're ready to be fertilized. So LH is at day zero, two days later they ovulate, so start breeding two, four, six, or three, five, seven, okay? But if you can get a positive LH, <coughs> life is beautiful. <laughs> life is absolutely beautiful. Because you know that those puppies, if you get a pregnant bitch, are going to be born 65 days plus or minus one day from the day of the LH. So is the LH just going to be a yes or no, or is that a number as well? That's an LH test right so there. So it's, it's like a yes you have it or no you don't have it? Well, let me show you this. This is orally on 3-4 at 8 a.m. Okay? You have, in order for it to be positive, this line has to be darker than that line. Okay? Anything else is negative. So this, this line is lighter and this line is darker, is negative. So orally LH in the morning on 3-4. The only problem with LH is sometimes it only lasts 12 to 24 hours. That's why I'm very lucky because I can do it twice a day. Um, if you, but nine times out of ten you pick it up by just doing it once a day. But you have to pull your blood at the same time every day. Yes, sir. Did you, uh, even though it was a positive in the AM, did you test in the PM just so you have? I did that for you. <laughs> just for you. <laughs> Please. Okay, just um, you had a positive in the AM. Basically, why did you do it in the PM? And I did it just to show you guys. That's all. That's all. That at last, I mean, I did not do the one the night before, and I probably should have. I probably should have done 3 3 PM. <coughs> but I did not do that. So that's, uh, anyway, the other thing that I, that I test is I test thyroid in my bitches because thyroid is, uh, can cause infertility in bitches. And it basically causes them not to be able to take the puppies to term. 
you can get them pregnant, but they don't go to term. So it's very important. Now, collies are different than other breeds. There is a range when you run your thyroids that go from like 0.8 to 4.2 or something like that. Okay? Collies should not be a 0.8. Collies should be 2.2 to 2.7. Okay? So if your collie comes in and it is a 1.2, it needs supplementation. It is not a toy poodle. Toy poodles can live at 0.8. Collies cannot reproduce that well. So 2.2 to 2.7 is where you want them. So if they need minor supplementation, you get it from your veterinarian and get them started on it. Or if you use a natural product, make sure that they're on the natural product. Same for males? So absolutely same for males. Absolutely. Okay, so are there any questions about that? With the thyroid, if you do it um, up at the stomach early in the morning, you do your practice to do, I've heard different things with that. I do my thyroid on an empty stomach, and it's usually mine. <laughs> no, I see, I see no difference whatsoever. Okay. Now, when you're retesting your thyroid, after you start on thyroid supplementation, the test needs to be taken two to four hours, or, well, it actually depends on the pill. Let's just do four hours after your morning pill. If you're doing thyroid, how long, how long do you take to retest? Two weeks. Supplement? Two weeks to retest if you've started thyroid, and then you need to do your test four hours after your morning thyroid pill. You have to do that. Uh, is there a, a confirming um, uh, a website where a local doctor would leave us? <laughs> 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 Call me, I'll be the butt up. Put her butt up. No, I get so many calls from, from doctors, and they say that this is normal, and just tell them, no, it's not normal for my breed. And if they don't believe you, Mary, just, just have a phone. You can have a call, any of the doctors in my office, and you'll see one that's on the, that's on the, uh, the PowerPoint. She's pretty nasty, too. She's a college person. And as a matter of fact, I need a male stable college. I need a male stable pet. I'm just putting that out there. Okay, when to start testing? I already told you that. What day do you start testing your bitch on? Six. Six. Okay, unless she is a weird one, right? <laughs> and there are some bitches that are really weird. Like I said, the Rottweiler that I didn't breed till day 26. Some bitches that, that don't show any signs of proestrus, and all of a sudden they're there, you know? Um, how often to test and which test and what they mean? If you are paying an arm and a leg to run these tests and you are breeding by natural breeding or you're breeding by artificial insemination and you're going to do it yourself, you really only need to do it every third day, starting on day six. Okay, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna see, okay, maybe on day six I'm baseline, which is like point, point zero 0.02 or point 0.2, it's really, really low. And then all of a sudden, three days later, I'm at a three, and then three days later, I'm at a six. I'm gonna start breeding on that six, okay? And I'm gonna breed every two days after that six. And I'm gonna breed three times because I had a male and female together. And she probably LH'd the day before the three. Okay, you're not sure because you don't have a blood sample to test, but she probably LH'd the day before the three. Okay, the different lab tests, Lynn Harrell. <coughs> different lab tests give different numbers. There are some progesterone, some tests that are in-house progesterone tests that are run on different machines, and that's when, when I went about flipped when we had like an 80 on a progesterone or a 40 on a progesterone. And, but they are different machines. All you have to do is divide it by three and you get the proper number. Um, because I've never seen a progesterone, except in a tumor situation, go up to 80, but I've seen them go up to 40. Um, the different lab tests that you can use, you can use your witness tests, you can use your, your um, target test, you can use Camelot Farms. Uh, Gentrex puts out a um, repro check, a canine re 
the canine progest check test. They are all inexpensive. Just go online, look at them, see which one you want to play with. You're going to make an investment of a little bit of money. We'll play with some of these today and, um, you know, and, and see if you can figure them out. The pre-mate, which is okay. I don't personally like the uh, one from Camelot Farms. It's too involved. I like putting a drop on a serum on a little thing and telling you that it's blue. You know, it's, I'm a little lazy that way. Okay, and the other thing is, is that LH is king. I'm going to send this around. We'll start it here. I'm going to show you the back because this is so, this is orally. This is the one you already saw the picture of. Those are her two. You can open them up. You know, yeah, it's, it's a positive and a negative. So that, I mean, and when I get one of those, I'm the happiest person in the world. But LH is king. When you get that, you know everything else that's going to happen during that breeding cycle. You, if you're going to breed with frozen semen, you breed five and a half days after. That means if you have to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to do it, you get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to do it. But you breed five and a half, five and a half um, days after your LH. Okay. So, any questions at this point? All right. Health screening them with the dog. I put one month prior, I lied. I want to do it at least two to three months prior because of the, the uh, problem with the sperm. If I find a dog that has no sperm, I need three months, two to three months for a full sperm cycle to see if I can get him fertile again. I do his family breeding history. Does he come from a line of dogs that lose their ability to breed by the time they're three years old? That have some sort of autoimmune problem that causes them to kill off their own sperm? Which is very popular in a lot, in a lot of breeds. That's why some of these dogs that are great producers as youngsters all of a sudden have no sperm. Okay. Um, I check his fertility. This is Dr. Jones. She is my right arm at the hospital. She's the one that's mining the store. Um, she probably knows. She's, she's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. And this dog is um, the mother of Minnie Moto. I don't know how many of you are Minnie Moto. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, He's an older dog, and, and we do a full physical exam on the dog. We go from stem to stern. We check the teeth. We palpate the abdomen to make sure there are no abdominal masses. I hate to have a surprise, especially when I'm using an older dog, of having a splitting tumor that, that I'm collecting the dog and he passes away while I'm collecting it. Okay. We check the lymph nodes. Make sure this dog does not have lymphosarcoma. Because you don't want to breed the dog, even though the dog may still be fertile, you don't want to breed him if he has lymphosarcoma. So we check that. We check the heart. We want to make sure that the heart has been certified, especially a dog that's used as much as this one. And we also want to make sure that there's nothing new going on in the heart. So we do a full physical exam on these animals. Okay. And can you see that? Can you see the penis? Okay, we pull the sheath back all the way. We pull the sheath back all the way, and we check for everything. We check for things called persistent frenulums. A frenulum is a little piece of tissue that goes from here down to here, and when you pull the penis out of the sheath, it does this. So there's no way that you can get a breeding on a bitch. And that's something that's very easy to take care of. You take a little tweezer and you go, and it's all better. <laughs> but we take, we take the, uh, sorry, okay. We take the penis all the way out of the sheath. We look for um, any kind of infection because you know a lot of dogs that don't clean themselves well um, or have some sort of doggy VD as we call it. Um, they'll get kind of smegma down there. They'll get this real dirty stuff down by their by their prepuce and it gets all sticky and everything. And we check that to make sure there's not even, none of that going on. And um, we extrude the penis all the way out past the sheet, past the, and then past the ball. So that's what we do. We check the inguinal area to make sure that there are no uh, inguinal hernias. Because if you get a dog to get an erection and ejaculate, he's going to be thrusting. So you don't want to cause a bigger problem there. We check the prostate. It's my favorite picture. <laughs> 
We check the prostate. We check the prostate for a lot of things, and there are a lot of problems that cause infertility that a lot of us don't realize. There, there are normal prostatic washes, and then there are prostatic washes where you can actually see infection, and then there are prostatic washes where you can see carcinoma. And these are bad situations for the dog and dogs that, as long as it's normal, fine. But if you've got an infection in there, remember, prostatic fluid's gonna be going into that bitch. Your sperm count's gonna be terrible. And you're just passing on bad stuff. So you don't wanna uh, do anything with that. Okay, the next one. We need to look at the jewels, okay? We need to make sure that both of those testicles are perfect. If one of them is large and one of them is small, then we check and make sure that there's not a tumor in one. As males get older, they get what's called testicular atrophy, where their testicles start to get small. That's absolutely normal in the male dog, all right? Um, but the other thing that we have picked up, and I know none of us would do this, but we have picked up dogs that have had descended to had, had testicles pulled down. Because you can actually feel a testicle that is in the scrotum and then fill the second testicle and know that it has been surgically corrected. So that's something that, that's a no-no to do, okay? But you can feel it when you're doing the exam. And we usually talk to the owner at that point about, you know, what's going on here, because that is something that is genetically passed on. So. Okay, next one. All right, this is what we do with the prostate. If I run into a prostate that I'm a little bit worried about, I do, what, I do what's called a prostatic wash. This is normal prostatic cells. See how pretty they are and how normal they are and how, how, how uniform they are? This one over here is a prostatic infection. And if you look, you can see all those little dots in there. Those were all bacteria. If I inseminate a bitch with this, I may as well just be giving her disease, okay? Plus, I'm not gonna be giving her very good sperm because this sperm is not gonna be good at all. The one that I hate it when I see it is when I see sperm cells like, I mean, the prostatic cells like this, because that's prostatic uh, carcinoma. And in dogs, you know, the incidence of prostatic cancer is as high in neutered dogs as it is in unneutered dogs. Yeah, I was really surprised, but it's about a 50-50. But this is, um, there's not a, whole, not a whole lot that we do with prostatic cancer in dogs. It's not like what they do in people with the ablations and everything else. Um, but um, I have a lot of people that come into me and they want to they save the sperm on their dog with prostatic cancer. And I'm like, you know, here you have an eight-year-old dog that has prostatic cancer. There is some indication that cancer has a genetic predisposition, but we all know that. But, okay, next one. After I collect the male, I evaluate the sperm. This is one of the things that is probably done the worst of anybody, that, of anything that I've ever seen in veterinary medicine. See this guy? That's the only normal one up there. When you look at sperm, you have to really evaluate it and look in between the lines. Because as long as you have a lot of sperm going in that direction, and you have at least 100 million mobile sperm going in that direction, or you know, swimming nicely, then you have a dog whose sperm can be played with. And when I get sperm where I have a lot of these kinked and curly tails, where, these guys go in circles. How could they go straight? They've got a kinked and curly tail. I mean, look at this one. The acrosome, which is the top part of the sperm, is, uh, is the part that goes and hits the side of the egg, and goes bang it, bang it, bang it, and let me in. And if the acrosome is not attached to the top of the, of the sperm, it will not inseminate the egg. And then we have these interesting ones over here that are detached. They're headless horsemen. They have they have no tails on to them. And then we, we really I have to tell you, especially sperm sperm from a dog that has an infection, we see some of the weirdest things. There's a double-headed sperm. Now that one's not gonna give you twice as many puppies. <laughs> but that is a double-headed sperm and it is not gonna inseminate anything. The only one up there that's going to be able to inseminate is that is that one right there. I look at my motility. I look at my forward progression. How many sperms are swimming in this direction, or how many sperms are swimming in this direction? We evaluate our our uh, forward progression by a number: five being the best, and then zero being dead, or zero being actually zero being not moving at all. 
because if there's no sperm, it can't be dead. Okay, so five would be the best, and zero would be the worst. So if you have a dog that has a lot of sperm going in this direction, but then you have a few that are going like this, I add a little bit of an additive to it, and my ugly sperms go to float to the top. I suck those off. I check my bad, my good sperm at the bottom, and now I have a bunch of sperm because these these guys get in the way. I mean, they're like they're like crazy people. They get in the way. They're going in circles, and then you got all these sperm that are trying to go by them. So you know, it's just the way that it happens. So what I do once I get my normal sperm, I that's when I count my number. I don't count my number on the bunch of idiots that I have swimming around the circles. Because I can get a, a sperm count that's huge, but they're totally useless sperms. And so, what age do you do this? Do you different ages with different dogs? You know what? I do it once they're at sexual maturity. And that to you is for a collie? A collie's about seven to eight months. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also like to train them. Because, you know, I like to set the mood and the whole thing for them. So we'll do that. In a minute. Okay, um, morphology you have, motility you have, um, speed of forward progression. How many are modal? Um, are there 75%? There better be at least 75% or I'm not going to use it. Yeah. Um, I've heard the term immature sperm. Yes. Okay. Do, how do they look different from the mature sperm? Immature sperm will have little things like droplets. Okay? Proximal droplets are bad news bears. Okay? Those the proximal droplets? I can't <laughs> <laughs> Proximal droplets. Those are bad. Oh, okay. Okay. Distal droplet is a young sperm. Um hey. <laughs> okay. Distal drop would be a young sperm. Okay, immature sperm. All right. And usually, remember, the sperm sits in the epididymis for a long time. You're not really usually getting sperm from the testicles when you ejaculate. Them. So, you're, you've got if you've got sperm that's been sitting there, um, and you clean them out and clean them out and clean them out, and now you're starting to get sperm from the testicles. You're going to get some of those distal droplets. That's okay. Distal droplets do not bother me as much as headless horsemen or two-headed sperm. Okay, there, there are certain things that really, really bother me, and those quail tails. I mean, they're kind of so the normal count. Yes. Is it possible to get a out of this slideshow? Is it? Po of course it is, because I. It will be. We will do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, the next thing, what was I doing? Okay. We got the count. Oh, your count. Your count should be. Yeah. You can say, do you normally clean your dogs out? Yes. Before you, you do. Yes. I always clean my dogs out before I, before I breed them. If they're not being used constantly, and I mean constantly once a month. How many days Um, I might do it like a week ahead. Yeah. Because if there's a problem, I need to know about it right away. I mean, if I need to do a culture on that sperm and get them on something with we'll bullet them, I need to know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Absolutely. Because remember, it sits around in the epididymis. The epididymis, you know, it's not going to live forever in that. It's not like a frozen semen tank. So it does, it does die. It does die. So for every 10 pounds of dog, your ejaculate should have. 100 million total number of live sperm. Okay. No, it's, it can be, no, that's, that's, how, that's per mil, yes. Okay, per mil. 100 million total number of live sperm. That means for a 60 pound dog, it should have 600 million total number of live sperm for ejaculate. Yeah. Okay. It takes 100 million total live sperm per insemination to get a bitch pregnant. So that means if you have a super duper healthy ejaculate from a 60 pound dog, you should be able to get six bitches pregnant. 
but that's in the perfect world. <laughs> there are a lot of things that come into consideration. Um, if the dog's exercising a lot, it's just like a it's just like a, a female athlete that doesn't menstruate. You know, if they're exercising a lot, a lot of times the uh, the uh, test the um, sperm count will go down. Um, if it's exposed to a lot of heat, I don't know how your dog was after what you know after going to Westminster, how anybody's dog was. But I can tell you that the heat that they were exposed to when they were in the benched area at Westminster, we lost uh, a lot of dogs' fertility because of that. And it comes back. It comes back. But for, for, you know, everybody says, oh, it's a big winner, so they want to breed to them. But for two or three months, you have no sperm. So, wow. Until, yeah, I mean, it was really dangerous. And I didn't really realize what was happening until after three or four years of being there and being in those horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. Do you culture spurs routinely or not routinely? When you suspect a problem? Not routinely when I suspect a problem because I examine it, and if I don't see bacteria, then I'm usually okay. okay. Okay, sorry. Do I culture sperm? Not necessarily. If, if, there, if there's a problem, the sperm looks dirty. Yeah, I do. But remember, when I collect a dog, I always clean this prepuce because that prepuce, a lot of times, dogs don't clean themselves. So I make sure I clean that. With what? Just a, just a, um, um, soap and water. No, not soap and water. <laughs> okay, think about it. Think about it. Um, no, I use a warm washcloth. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm very gentle. Very gentle, yeah, very gentle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you culture if you're going to freeze it? You can culture if you're going to freeze it, but most freezings kill everything that's in there. So you're pretty good. Uh, culture, nah, <laughs> yeah. they didn't. They didn't charge extra. They're just good businessmen. That's all. <laughs> okay. So and I, I look at my abnormal cells and I see what my net, why, you know, what my abnormal cells are, and I make a record of all of this. Okay, we're ready. Okay. Can you? Th this is a little video. This just shows. Just shows sperm moving. Okay, we're gonna look at sperm anyway. Isn't that pretty? Isn't that pretty? Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Now this is a sperm sample that I'm gonna have to dye, take down. It has some bad sperm in. It had to be. It had to be tweaked a little bit to get rid of the bad sperm, suck the bad sperm out, and then um, add some activator to the other sperm. I mean, we have fun with this stuff. This is what we do all day. Yes? <laughs> How do you get rid of the bad sperm? How do I get rid of it? I use a serum separator, and, it, and, and you spin it a little bit, and all the, because usually the nasty looking sperm rises to the top, and you just take that supernatant off, and then you reconstitute it, with um, some extender, and then you use it. I just love this picture. <laughs> but if you notice, they're not all going in a straight direction. Some of them are going like this. Like, okay. Anyway, so that's one semen sample. But it's live. I mean, it's live. There are lots of, are you ready for the next one? This is another semen sample. Can you run it? Look at that. Oh, we'll stop. Okay, go back. Well, there's one sperm here, and then there's another sperm that just left. <laughs> that is not a good sperm sample. That would, remember, it takes 1,000 sperm agitating the outside of an egg for that lucky one to get through. Okay, so this has got none, so it's got two. Yes. Is that fixable? It was, it was on this one, yes. When you go through the sperm banks with the dogs, yes, we usually do serum, use serum separates. Yeah, we, throw the, we, throw the, 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 we put the good ones in. Why should we waste space storing the bad ones? So they, do, they serum separate. 
Well, the banks used to be required to be AKC registered. Now they've become a little more lenient. So you really want to go to one that's AKC registered because they do come in and check. So. Okay, next. All righty, libido. Does everybody know what libido is? <laughs> I got to tell you, if you would have been in the hallway today, you would have seen libido because we had Grady and we had Orly together. And Grady was going, babe, I want to give you a cigarette. I got a drink, you know. He was wanting to wine and dine her, you know. Um, but I like, to, I like a dog that has good libido, especially when I'm collecting him. Um, I don't like a dog that has such great libido that he jumps on my back and scratches me while he's breeding the bitch. I also don't like a dog that has such great libido that he's faster getting to the bitch than I am getting to his penis. So, and that's only happened once and thank God it was my dog. <laughs> but, <clears throat> I want a dog to have good libido. How do we increase libido? The best way to do it is to have a bitch in heat that's there. Um, we use the, um, you can also use a little drug that's called eau de estrus. What I do if I don't have a bitch around in heat, and I usually have bitches in heat all the time, um, is I will use a towel on a bitch that's really in heat and I'll put it all over and then I'll put it in the freezer and bring out another bitch and put the towel in the back of the other bitch and that will act as a, as a teaser. Um, electro ejaculate, I don't do this very often. I would not even suggest you do this very often. It's not a machine you really want to have at home. <laughs> okay, there's some other things that I do. There's some other things that I do because I want my male to feel comfortable. I want him to feel really comfortable. So with laser, what I used to always do is I would get him a special collar. He had a special breeding collar. And he knew every time that he put that special breeding collar on that he was going to be collected. He knew the show collar, he knew the breeding collar. So we started it with that. Um, and I got him used, I would always take him into the same room in my hospital. And I put nice flooring down there so he had a nice place to, you know, to stand. And what I usually would do is I usually would have bitch and heat smell on that carpet. And that would get him a little bit more excited. So, um, so the same collar, same room. The way that I collect it, there's a variety of what I collect. Sometimes I've been in a situation where the only thing that I've had is a baggie. I know you've all probably used a baggie. Yeah. No? I mean, it's not the, not the neatest card in the world, but at least you can see through it. But I used to use these tubes for a long time, but they are latex tubes. And latex is bad for sperm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so what you do is you take this and run the sperm picture, and you put it over the you put it over the penis, and then you hold around the bowl, and you have a tube down here, and you change your tubes because they're going we're gonna show the three fractions of the sperm. Okay? There's pre-sperm, there's sperm, and then there's post-sperm. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Now the new way to do it, this is a hoopty doo way. This is put out by um, MiniTube of America, and they're doing incredible things as far as being able to revive dogs and things like that, and, you know, dogs that were not able to breed. And it's red, white, and blue, which is very big. To <laughs> I'm sure they did that for a reason. And then we have little tubes, and we collect the tubes. You always have to label. You come over here. You always have to label the name of the dog here because if you're doing three or four inseminations at the same time, you want to make sure that you label the dog's name on that. <laughs> and when we're when we're in the hospital, the last thing we want is a chihuahua put into a great dane. <laughs> what? Yeah, like Matthew the fox terrier. Which Matthew? I have a Matthew that's a fox terrier and a Matthew that's a uh, collie, so that was, which one? You don't want to bring to a fox terrier. Anyway, these are, the, these are the three, and it doesn't really matter what order you put it in, but, um, but uh, you're going to collect the first pre-sperm in the, in the first one, then you're going to put it down, then you're going to collect 
the sperm rich fraction in the second one, and then you're going to put it down, and then you're going to take the prostatic fluid, and you don't need to take all the prostatic fluid. Your sperm rich, I mean, your, your pre sperm may be zero, or it may be up to two. It, it may be up to two. Most dogs that are used a lot do not have a lot of pre sperm. So you're going to see the good stuff coming out to begin with, especially in this dog, you're going to see, see the good stuff coming out. The second one are, is for the sperm, and it is the rich, creamy part. And it goes anywhere from 0.5 cc's to 2 cc's. Okay? And then your prostatic fluid. When I tell, when I get people that say, I collected 75 cc's of sperm from my dog, I go, that's great. That's great. Don't send that to me. But um, <laughs> prostatic fluid can be up to 75 to 100 cc's. I mean, it just keeps coming and coming. And that's what happens during the tie. And if you use that for chilled semen, the prostatic fluid will actually be de detrimental to the, um, the sperm that you have in there. Okay? It is made specifically to um, lubricate and uh, neutralize the vagina of the bitch. It is not made to stay around for three or four days. Okay, so we have these three parts. Can we do the next, uh, I think the next one's, oh, we're setting the mood first. <laughs> this, okay, every male has his love, love and affection bucket. And this happens to be his. This is a little bulldog that comes in and he frequently, apparently he comes from like these magnificent, magnificent lines. And um, he's very proud of himself. <laughs> but you can't collect him with a bitch in heat. He, you have to bring his pillow in. <laughs> and he uses his pillow to, and, and to, uh, to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very sad. It's very sad. <laughs> OK, I think the next one is. OK. <laughs> this, is, this is actually the same dog that is being collected, OK? Thank you guys so much for getting this going. Okay, Dr. Jones is getting her hand up behind the, the, uh, the bulb of the penis, and she's giving a slight thrust, but you don't have to do this. And then after that, all she's gonna do is touch the tip of the penis to the edge of the blue cup, because what you do is you just tip it like this. You don't have to continue doing this. You just tip it. See how she just tipping it? And this dog has no pre-sperm. So this is all sperm coming down in there. Now, see, did you see that fast move? How she changed from one cone, cone to the other? And that's the dog, that's the dog's penis. Now we're collecting prostatic fluid. There are a lot of reasons you collect prostatic fluid because if you're not getting any sperm, you can check that prostatic fluid. You can find out by the uh, thing called alkaline phosphatase where the problem is. Uh, sperm is being produced but not coming out. You can check that. <laughs> okay, so that's the pre-sperm. I mean, that's this pre-sperm and sperm-rich fraction, and that's the prostatic fluid. Okay, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to we're going to do a demo on that. Everybody got it? It's really easy. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. All right. You're ready. So how long did that whole procedure really take? Are we watching you? That's all you really did. Well, it depends on the male. It depends on the male. Some males take a half an hour. He takes about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Is the pre-sperm clear? Pre-sperm is usually clear. Yeah. And then how long does that phase last? Like if you're collecting, how long do you, do you expect that to? Well, it depends, it depends on the dog. And once I see that creamy part come out, if I don't have time to change my, change my cone, I don't have time to change my cone. And, so and it doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt anything. It doesn't hurt anything. Yes, question. Um, you said earlier that you start collecting your dog at a very, what age? Seven, eight months. Five, eight months. Mm -hmm. um, I, st I bring my dogs in at seven to eight months to start training them how to be bred. If they're going to be stud dogs, then I don't want them. I don't want an 11 year old dog that's a virgin. Okay? That's what I don't want. Okay. Yes. Quick question. Um, years ago, we used to put the sperm.
sperm in your bra and keep it warm and everything. My reason that it isn't that fragile. It isn't that fragile. It isn't that fragile. You actually can take that sperm and put it on the counter. Okay, is the sperm really, really fragile? I think we all just got into putting it in our bra and walking around with it because we thought that it was the thing to do. Um, it was really difficult when I had male veterinarians. So. <laughs> but um, it is, you actually can just go sit it on the counter. As long as it's room temperature, you can, it'll sit. Remember, it's been sitting in testicles that are outside of the body. Okay, but your body, your body surface temperature is, is what, about 85? Yeah. Okay. Now this is the, the three parts of sperm. <coughs> This is a sperm retraction, right here. It's about a cc. When somebody sends me something like this and says it's a sperm retraction, I know there's something wrong with it. Because there is no way that I have 10 cc's of sperm retraction out of a dog. So that's the one that I take and I look at it and it's usually full of pus. And it's usually full of pus from um, something like um, prostatic abscess, something like that. Some people never look at the sperm before they, before they uh, send it. Now, just to make it a little bit different, if this were my sperm, sperm retraction and I were going to extend it, and extending is called feeding, you feed it a special food so it will survive the trip from Florida to Washington State, or from Florida to Japan, or wherever. You feed it some certain food and that way the food will keep everything going and it will keep them viable. Um, so what I will do is I will go ahead and I will add to this, I probably, if they're going to do a transcervical insemination, which we'll look at later, I usually like to give them up to about three total. So I'll put in two cc's of extender in there, two cc's of food, and then I'll ship it. I'll ship it like that. Okay. The older male, what to expect? What is normal? You can increase the sperm ejaculate in an older man if you give him an injection of prostaglandins F2 alpha, and you want to give it to him about a half an hour before he is, he is ejaculated. Because older males in general do not ejaculate effectively. The sperm also tends to be a little, little uh, lower in number, but you still can get a normal ejaculate. Remember, you only get 100 million sperm for a normal ejaculate. Pardon? About half an hour before you're going to do it, you want to give him an injection of prostaglandins F2 alpha, and that will increase his sperm production. Yes? For purposes of this discussion, what age constitutes an older <laughs> um, probably about eight or nine. What I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about the male that, that is um, might have a little bit of arthritis, might be a little reluctant to ejaculate, might have have um, um, some problems ejaculating. Okay, I'm thinking about that one. An hour before? Half an hour before. Half an hour before. Okay. We're going to go to breeding methods. And what a success rate. I consider a success rate of pregnancy. The rest is up to you. <laughs> okay. If I am doing the timing and I get the bitch pregnant, and I diagnose her with a pregnancy at 28 to 30, 25 to 30 days, then the rest of it's up to you. And the rest of it's up to just how much, how involved you want to get and how much you want to do as far as testing. If you have a bitch that has no problems, let her go through after diagnosing pregnancy all the way through. And if she whelps a normal litter, then don't worry about it. But if you have a bitch that resorbs her puppies, you need to find out why she resorbs her puppies. Okay, I did my job, I got her pregnant, okay? All right, next. <coughs> Different types of breeding. First, there is the part that nature has always worked. Side by side or fresh or natural breeding. I mean, 
natural breeding has worked for years and years and years. Unfortunately, the way that we like to su suggest our, that we like to select our males, a lot of times the males don't want the females. Females are aggressive bitches. Sometimes we intervene too much. So, um, natural the sperm actually lasts in the bitch for up to seven days. I have seen it last up to ten days. So if your timing's not exactly right, and you've got sperm up there that lasts up to ten days or seven days, then you've got a good chance of getting pregnant. Okay. Oh, these are naturals. <laughs> this is Jim. Jim put these in there. This is okay. Next. Uh, okay. Next. Okay. Elephants can do it. We can do it. Okay. Um, extender types. Okay. If you are going to be doing chilled semen, and how many of you do chilled semen? <coughs> Okay. If you are doing chilled semen, there are three different extenders that you can use. A lot of different companies make them. Camelot makes a good one. I see us International Canine Semen Bank has a good one. Um, uh, Mini Tube of America has a good one. There are a lot of different good chilled semen. But there are three different types that you can use. Thank God. Originally, there was only a two-day extender that lasted two days. And that meant that if you didn't get the sperm down there within exactly the right time or your bitch was not exactly ready, that your sperm was not going to be any good. Now we have a five-day extender that gives you a wider window to work with. So if I can call up and say, hey, my bitch just ovulated, can you send me down some sperm? Then you know that if your bitch just ovulated, okay, and those eggs, she LH two days ago, she ovulated today, I needed the serum in the next couple of days. You know that if it gets there in the next couple of days, you're gonna get her pregnant, okay? Now they have 10 day extender. And this stuff really does work. I mean, it, it actually keeps the, the sperm alive for 10 days. So with a 10 day extender, what you do is you call them up and say, my bitch is in heat. You wait until her progesterone hits two, three, and you have it sent in. And then you test your bitch. So you know exactly when to breed her. But you've got that sperm sitting at your house, so you don't have to worry about what I just worried about, which was the storms up north, because I just had, had sperm shipped in. Um, you don't have to worry about anything like that. My, my, um, your kits that you're gonna use cost between $85 to $100. The extension and evaluation of a veterinarian will cost between $100 and $250. Your FedEx charges are $60 to $120, and you must do DNA. <coughs> And we're going to show today how to do DNA too, okay? So if, it, if, if any of you are doing chill, it doesn't seem like a lot of you are doing chill and, send, and shipping semen. And dog collies do beautifully with ship semen. They really do. Yes, sir? Is there a downside to using a, a extender for a longer period of time? Is there a what? Is there a downside? Is there any reason why you wouldn't just automatically use a 10-day extender? Is it's more expensive. Repeat the question. Is there a down, is there a bad reason not to use a 10 day extender? And the, the answer to it is it's more expensive than a five day extender. So, I mean, the, the it's it's economics, purely economics. Yes, yes, sir. I, I did one short semen uh, years ago, and the first shipment with an extender, um, when it got to me, um, all the sperm was dead. So, and we left, we left the vet, they were alive when we left the vet. In New Hampshire. So we changed extenders, and the second and third shipment that we received, the sperm were alive. Do you, is there, have you seen this that some extenders will actually knock out to see the sperm? There are different extenders, and that's why at my office I have different extenders. And even though I like extender that big, I make fresh extender every time that we do it. But Camelot has an excellent extender too. I mean, they really have an excellent extender. Yes. What's in the ex what is extender? Extender depends on the one that you get. The one that I use has egg yolk in it and a propylene glycol, and it protects the uh, protects the sperm. Plus, it has antibacterial stuff. Blah 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 blah. So, it's yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you. Anymore. It was like a month prior when somebody was inquiring 
That's exactly right. That's exactly what I do. I, because I have, my golden retrievers in general are Camelot kids. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Cindy, could you please? Yes. 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 Um, there are different extenders that are on the market, and some dogs extend better with others, with, with some, one than another. And um, what we were talking about was about a month or two before you take your dog in to be shipped. Take your dog in, get it ejaculated, and test it with the different extenders. Stick it in the refrigerator overnight. See what it looks like the next day. I mean, that, that's very, very smart to do, and that's one of the biggest problems that we have, is that not every dog likes the same extender. So, bless you. Does the length of extender you use have any correlation to the life of the sperm after they're inseminated? No. Okay. Does the length of the, does the type of extender that you use um, increase the life of the, of the sperm once it's inside of the pitch? And the answer is no. Once it's inside of the pitch, you, you hope that it goes right up there to those oviducts and the, that it inseminates the males. I mean, inseminates the eggs. So. Yes? Okay, another thing we did, because we weren't sure when the bitch was going to ovulate, we had to get the sperm there, so my repro vet put a little bit of extra in. So if they didn't need it right away, it was coming close to nearing the end of the time of the extension, they said they could give her a little bit more to feed it and keep it alive a little bit longer. So when they didn't need it. So, <coughs> so even though it was a five day extender, they put in some extra, so they had it for a few more days. That's cheating. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay though. It's okay. It's okay. You learn how to play with all this stuff. Okay, when I get my chilled, my chilled semen, you see how this little tube is labeled? This is what I love to get. Now, I gotta tell you something. Chilled semen doesn't have to be done by a veterinarian anymore. You know that. AKC rules no longer require it to be done by a veterinarian. So, yeah, they took the veterinarian out of, out of the mix, which I'm hoping they put the veterinarian back in the mix. Um, because it leaves too much room for things to happen. But I like to have my sperm come to me with the date of birth of the dog, the dog's call not name, and the breed. I get these boxes, I get these boxes of sperm. We do a lot of breeding in our office. I get these boxes of sperm, and I'll have six or seven boxes of sperm. One is named Toby, one is named Sam, another one's Arthur, and I'm like, okay guys, which one goes to which bitch? So then that makes more work for us where my, where my nurse has to go and call the individual person and, okay, so what's the dog's call name, you know? And at that point, I start to get a little worried because if I make a mistake and the wrong sperm goes in the wrong dog, there's nothing worse than Irish Wolfhound and Doberman Crosses. They're really ugly. <laughs> They're both big. But and like I said, DNA is a requirement. DNA is something that you can order yourself, you can do yourself. It's a cheek swab. We have them. I'm going to do one on Orly today because since she's, has a, she's being bred to three sires, um, we're going to show you how to do um, a, um, multiple, a DNA swab. 